this lecture will talk about a problem that shows up uh, very much in actual systems. Typical systems have zero mean inputs, and this shouldn't be a surprise, as we've typically assumed zero mean signals for everything that we've done so far. But let's look at where these signals actually come from and see that we'll see that there's a little bit of a difference. So a typical system will have uh, some sensor in the real world, and then it has a blocking capacitor. This makes sure that, uh, along with maybe some bias circuitry added here, to make sure that the voltage levels are correct, uh, the signal goes into the ADC uh, with the uh, uh, voltage uh, the DC voltage blocked. What we get out is X of N. So now when we actually go to look at the spectrum of this, we don't have, we'll assume right now, just for sake of argument, that X of N, or X of T was white. Probably wasn't, but we'll assume that for now. If we look at the frequency now of X of N, it's going to look something like this. Because of the blocking nature of that uh, capacitor, the, low pass filter, the high pass filter nature of the capacitor. And so with something like this, we're going to have eigenvalues of zero that uh, occur because we're missing the low frequencies. At least we're missing DC, and uh, the low frequencies have low energy. So what happens when we have eigenvalues uh, of our x that are 0? Well, we've run across this before. We have our um, convergence modes look like this. And in the case of an eigenvalue of 0, oops, that doesn't equal 0, that equals 1. And so 1 to the n, of course, <laughs> equals 1 for all, all values of n. In other words, our weight misadjustment never decreases, at least along some dimension. So this has some additional problems with uh, finite precision systems, which every system is to some degree. So let's look at a setup here and explore what we can do about it. Actually, I guess before we get all the way into what we can do about it, I want to illustrate some other aspects of the problem. First, for this system, shown here, W of n will not converge, and it actually may diverge. X comes in, it's missing uh, Rx, is not full rank. Uh, we're missing the DC values. And the noise, perhaps, may be zero mean, but it's got some energy at DC as all um, um, I'm sorry, as all white noise sequences do. So now let's look at uh, what makes this worse. If we have a finite arithmetic, and we could go with fixed point, or maybe it's just floating point instead of double precision, or maybe even double precision causes the problem. Causes the problems, although I've found that usually not. But it does depend on how long you run the run your system. So let's assume now that we have our DC blocked uh, input, we have finite precision. Finite precision means that when we calculate our filter outputs, and we calculate the error, there will be rounding that occurs in that calculation. That rounding will have uh, randomly, uh, occasionally, some DC component. That DC component will then be fed back into the weights. So now the weights will be adjusted so that they have a slight DC offset. However, that DC offset is never excited by X. X has no um, DC value. It's a high-pass signal. 
And so the high pass signal multiplying this uh, signal with a DC value, the DC value will just uh, disappear in that uh, inner product. And so it comes out the far end and there will be some error. It's fed back into the weights. The weights have this DC offset and it may increase. So over time a DC offset will show up into our filter weights and this DC offset will never be corrected by X of N. Everything works well for a while and then suddenly the DC offset becomes large enough that filter weights saturate or reach the um, uh, numeric representation limits for that particular fixed point or maybe even a floating point value. At which point the uh, they will adjust wrong. It will no longer have the same DC value. The error will be enormous and that enormous error will bring the weights back down to where they should be. Once that happens, or at least within range, once that happens the cycle repeats. And so what this looks like in a real system is something that works for several minutes and then suddenly the weights um, saturate. We get complete garbage out and then it adapts again and works again for several minutes and this cycle repeats. Okay, now that we've set up the correct context, we can look at ways of doing this. Um, the straightforward way, and I've actually, in looking at uh, deployed systems, seen each of these used, uh, the straightforward way is to periodically compute the mean of your weights and subtract it out. There's something just a little bit inelegant about that. It kind of feels like a patch and it's not the most effective way and it's not used very often that I've seen. Furthermore, this is only going to work for DC blocked inputs. Well, that's what we've been talking about, uh, is the DC blocked inputs. But there may be other, other types of signals. Maybe in addition to the DC blocking, we are missing uh, other parts of the spectrum. An example of this might be if we had a signal that was put through a low-pass filter that had several zeros in higher frequencies. So it's knocked out those frequencies as well. This isn't going to help with that. Uh, another approach to keep things under control is the leaky LMS algorithm. I've actually seen this uh, used quite a bit in actual systems. And the reason why is it can be very easy to implement and it's very effective. In this algorithm, we do the weight update as before but we have this uh, factor out in front of our old weights. And so we're going to want mu to be greater than zero. I guess it could be equal to zero, it's no longer leaky, and much less than one. So typically, what I've seen is that this is going to be uh, two to the minus k for a fairly large k. So if we're dealing with fixed point arithmetic, integer math, for example, k may be 14 or 15. And so if you now have 16-bit uh, arithmetic, we're essentially removing uh, the LSB or some of the LSBs from our um, mu each time. And so this would be implemented as um, w plus w, or I'm sorry, minus w. It's been right shifted 14 times. So it's very easy to implement in uh, a computer uh, where this multiplication is just handled by a shift. 
Okay, so if x of n is equal to 0, wn goes to 0. You have to have an input for this to keep going. Okay, let's spend some more time analyzing this, because as I said, it shows up frequently in practice. We want to know what's going on. So, as we did with the LMS algorithm, we will take the expected value of the weights, and we'll see what this converges to. So taking the expectation is going to give us, actually, maybe we should go back and unpack what just happened. We took e of n and expanded it out into d minus w transpose x, as before, and we stick that into our uh, weight updates. So the e times x is going to give us a d times x, which we have over in the far right of our bottom equation there. And the w transpose x um, multiplied by x. Remember we have uh, a w transpose x is a uh, scalar quantity. So we can take the transpose and swap it around. And that gives us this x, x transpose w that we've seen before in our analysis. And we put that over here in the center and pull out the w. We also factor out the w from our 1 minus mu times a gamma term. So we have this large expression. And we've had an expression like this before. We just have a few extra terms. And so when we do our expectation, we're going to get there. OK, we had to make the assumption, like we did with the, the LMS analysis, that w and x's were independent. This is probably not true, but we have to do something. So we did that, and it worked just as before. So we saw this same expression with LMS, except that this time we have an additional term, our gamma term in there. OK, so <clears throat> what does this mean for what we're actually going to adapt to. Well, let's go on to our next page, and we'll see it a little bit better. OK, first thing to note is this takes the place of Rx in our LMS system. So we could expect things to work kind of the same with, now we have modified Rx. So it's, we should note that these have eigenvalues. Are just the eigenvalues of Rx plus gamma. In other words, this whole system should converge if mu is now bounded by 2 over lambda x plus gamma. OK. Now, what does the leaky RMS converge to? Well, we would like it to converge to the optimal weight. But instead, it converges to something pretty close. So the impact of this is that our zero eigenvalues now become eigenvalues of gamma. And the large eigenvalues now become eigenvalues of lambda plus gamma. But if gamma is much smaller, then they're effectively unchanged. So this is a form of regularization that, that works really well. So once again, how did we get that? We got that by. There we go. By subtracting uh, 1 minus, or subtracting uh, mu times gamma times our weights.
at each weight update. There's another way of doing this type of uh, regularization, but slightly differently. I have seen this done before, but as I'd mentioned before uh, earlier in this lecture, the leaky LMS is the most common way of doing it. But our third approach is to get rid of zero eigenvalues by adding noise to our input. In this case, our autocorrelation matrix, assuming that our noise is uh, independent of our signal, is going to be the sum of the two autocorrelation matrices. And since the noise we can pick to be white, that will just be gamma times i. So the solution to this equation is going to be w tilde is equal to rx plus gamma i inverse rdx. Well, that's exactly what we had up above. So we can achieve this result either by uh, having leaky weights or by adding noise to uh, the input of our um, system. Well, leaky weights seem like a better idea for some reasons. Uh, for one, uh, if we add noise to the input, we would expect to have noise at the output. And we definitely don't want to have additional noise at the output. There's really no benefit of that in most cases. So what we do instead is if we're going to use this system, then you have your input, you add your noise, go into our adaptive filter as before, and we have our desired signal, the error, the update, and then we take our clean signal and branch it off. Let's put this another color. We run it through with the same filter weights that we've learned through our adaptation down below, but this version of the signal does not have the noise added. So this is going to be a clean output, but we have the benefits of our uh, regularized adaptation. In general, you probably wouldn't do this uh, when all we have to do is use leaky weights. But this structure of having the weights adapt and then periodically jump over to a clean output uh, path is common. We talked about that previously with the variable step size as one way to uh, keep adapting. And if things get out of uh, out of adaptation, then we freeze our uh, clean path until our adaptive filter adapts back to where uh, it gives us good outputs. And then we can copy the weights over. So this way, the clean output, we have the advantage of a regularized adaptive filter. And we have the advantage that we can decide when that clean output should adopt the weights from the adaptive filter so that we can avoid uh, large misadjustments or other types of problems that we may occur.